My name is Ronit Berkovich. I'm a partner in Wiles Restructuring Department based in the New York office. I'm a leader in our Women at Wile Affinity Group and a member of our task force on women's engagement and retention. I also serve on our nominating and hiring committees. I am pleased to be hosting this edition of the Wile Alumni Interview Series with one of my friends and former colleagues and a very dear person, Andrea Cristina Saavedra, who is the Assistant Dean and Dean of Judicial Clerkships at Columbia Law School. Andrea began her career as a restructuring associate in Wiles New York office. She then became in-house counsel at Nomura Securities and subsequently joined Goldman Sachs as a vice president in its conflict resolution group. In her position at Columbia Law School, she promotes judicial service by connecting Columbia Law to the courts and Columbia Law students to clerkship. Welcome, Andrea. Thank you so much, Ronnie. It is a real honor and pleasure to be here with you. Same. Um, to start, uh, your professional life is now geared towards establishing Columbia as a clerkship leader and placing law students into clerkships. You yourself clerked for a judge later in your career and also externed at one point for the wonderful Sonia Sotomayor. How impactful were those experiences to you and what were your biggest takeaways? Well, they were impactful at different times in my career. The first when I was a student at Columbia Law School. Uh, when I came to law school, I knew that I wanted to potentially pursue a career in public service or, or the judiciary. Even though I'm first generation American, I have um, a long tradition of lawyers on my father's side of the family, which is from Bolivia. And so my mentor, or my, my hero was um, my great aunt, who was the first female lawyer in Bolivia and actually became a Supreme Court justice of that country. So when I was a little girl, she used to instill in me that even though I was in the United States, I could do anything I wanted to do. And when I was at Columbia, I sought out somebody who I thought reminded me of my great aunt, which was now Justice Sonia Sotomayor. And my time with the justice as, a, as an intern uh, for my last year at Columbia was part of a class that we have still here at Columbia, where one student is placed with the judge of the Second Circuit for a semester. They have an opportunity to work on uh, bench memos, um, you know, legal issues with the pro se's office, and even at the end of the semester, actually argue an appeal before a panel of three judges. So I had the opportunity also to do that in front of Judge Sotomayor in my last year at Columbia. Um, it was very influential because I really learned about appellate practice and the standard of review. And so when I joined uh, Weil, um, in part because of you, Ronit, because you were my summer associate mentor, and I so admired you and thought that um, I wanted to be like that woman, um, I pretty quickly got put on a um, certiorari appeal uh, that was being handled by the litigation group. And that was just because somebody knew I had worked for Sotomayor and I understood, I understood standard of review for appellate uh, litigation. And so um, that was just kind of something that fell into my wheelhouse because of my time externing for the judge. Uh, and then later on in my career, I think that it was something that I, I knew I wanted to switch from corporate um, into public service or academia again. And so I did volunteer with a judge in New Jersey, the Honorable Stacey Mizell, where I learned about you know, what it was like to be a bankruptcy judge, which is completely different than my time at the Second Circuit. But I really valued both of those times because one was as a student, the other was as a very seasoned professional, kind of more understanding the challenges that our judges face. And so I think it really well prepared me for what I do now, which is connecting our students to clerkship opportunities, but also connecting our courts back to Columbia Law School. That's really nice. I learned a lot about you in that one answer. and. Um... I have very fond memories of your time as a summer associate here and as an associate. Um, while you were here, um, we had some very tremendous leaders at Weill, especially on the restructuring side, um, people like Marsha Goldstein and Lori Fife. Do you remember any lessons from working with leaders like them? Marsha Goldstein, who I know mentored both of us, uh, was somebody who from day one, I thought was grace under fire. Um, she never seemed to be um, bothered by adversarial um, huffery, I guess you could say, you know, when someone was just kind of threatening, you know, we're gonna do X, Y, Z. She was like, oh, I've seen that before, we'll deal with that. And I thought to myself as a first year, oh my God, if I, if I could just get garner that kind of strength, agility, professionalism um, and elegance, like that means you've reached kind of the pinnacle of your, of your practice. So for Marsha, I think I learned, you know, how a leader, 
um, could lead by, by example um, in terms of their demeanor, their grace, their grit, their ideas, uh, that people would follow someone who had a fantastic idea, that ideas really mattered in the courtroom and, and at the negotiating table. Um, and also, you know, same with Lori in terms of just how she was so analytical and, and also persuasive and really led again with ideas. Um, and I would also say, you know, I would include you as one of the, the, uh, the mentors, partners that I also you know, admired very much. In fact, I remember a story, I don't know if you remember this or not, Renee, because um, I think our peers do influence us a lot, um, probably more than we realized early on in our careers. But I had come back from maternity leave and we were working on a really challenging legal issue. And I was, I had come back and written something that I thought was completely, I thought no one's gonna believe this because everybody said the answer was no. And I came back and I said, well, mate, the answer is maybe yes. And you said to me, no, I think you mean yes. And let's go with yes. And then it changed like our entire strategy advising this client. And so I think a lot of what I saw with the female leaders a while, again, was that willingness to kind of like stand by your ideas, uh, you know, grace under fire, um, always watching out for each other's backs, um, you know, mentoring uh, younger, younger associates, um, even when things were difficult, making sure that people knew um, that we still wanted to see each other succeed. That's what I saw in the leaders at Weill, uh, the woman that I had the privilege of working with, um, including Deborah Dan to know, and some other folks who are now alums of the school of the, uh, of the firm as well. So I think I was uniquely privileged. I've always said this in my entire career. I've been uniquely privileged to be mentored by a number of women leaders. Um, I've said it before many times you've heard me say, but I feel like I wouldn't be where I am today if I didn't have people like Marsha to look up to um, as people that I could be one day. So I know how important it is. And clearly their lessons um, definitely wore off on you or impacted you because even as a, 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 an associate, you were always calm, confident, like you poised, um, really, you were always um, came across as beyond uh, your years, I think, because of the way you, 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 you presented yourself. Um, so um, you transitioned from a role in Goldman Sachs executive office to working at Columbia. Was it difficult to step away from corporate life? And really what drew you back to Columbia after all those years? So I like to say I never really left Columbia in some ways because when I joined, uh, when I joined Weill, Harvey Miller, who was the founder of our bankruptcy uh, group and mentored Marsha Goldstein, Lori, yourself, and so many of us, um, at the end of my first year, Harvey came back from Green Hill, and apparent, the story goes, what I've been told, is another, you know, a Columbia alumna and friend of ours, Michelle Meisey, said to me, um, Harvey was looking for somebody who took his class and, and did well, and you're the only person in the department, so I hope you want to be his TA this semester, and I almost fell out of my chair because I said, oh no, I'm so, I'm so intimidated, I hope this goes okay, and he came and spoke to me, and he said, you know, we go twice a week down to Columbia and, you know, um, I hope you will join me. Of course, I was going to say yes. First of all, I just, I, you know, I think, you know, this already, I, one of the reasons why I chose EFR was because I did have this academic bent and so I did, you know, potentially aspire to teach, which I have done here at Columbia. Um, and so um, once Harvey gave me the opportunity, uh, you know, for six years, I was down at Columbia's campus every spring, twice a week, plus preparing over the summer and the fall to come back and help Harvey with his course. Um, and so that was always something that I, I enjoyed and felt very proud that I was able to do. And, um, and that was the ethos in VFR. You know, Marsha taught at schools, um, Gary's taught at school, everybody, everybody gave back to their institutions. And so it just kind of felt like that was part of how I was, how I was introduced to the profession. Um, and so uh, I think What's more surprising to me is how long I stayed in corporate practice in some ways. You know, when I joined Weill, I think that I, I thought, okay, I'll do this for a couple of years and then I'm gonna probably transition to teaching or doing something differently. And, um, you know, I was so privileged to work with who I worked with that I think it, you know, it made the job so rewarding and, you know, cutting edge work. Um, I was only a third year when Lehman Brothers and, you know, AI, you know, all these large cases happen. So you just, you didn't wanna leave, you know, you have other partners now who, you know, risen through the department who had those opportunities and led those cases and did amazing work. Um, and so I think for me, it was more about trying to figure out exactly, you know, what my next step was going to be because I had enjoyed practice as much as I did. So um, going in-house, what was interesting is that Nomura had another wonderful female boss who I'm still really close to. And I got to do tons of different work there and I really enjoyed it. And then at Goldman, I kind of flipped from the legal side to the business side. 
not, not unlike Harvey. And I think not unlike Harvey, I was kind of like, you know, I really like being a lawyer more than being on the business side. I got to rethink what I'm going to do. So, so that's pretty much uh, how I started thinking about going back to uh, pursuing my initial passion, which was, you know, academia or teaching. Um, and so um, I shared the story with you before, but through a very good fortune um, in, in a colloquy at a, at a, at a, at a courthouse meeting, I, I ran into uh, Judge Gerber, or I should say specifically, Judge Stacey Mizell said, you should talk to Judge Gerber because you want to teach. And so you should talk to somebody else. And so I, I connected with him and he very generously said, you know, why don't you come and, and consider uh, teaching with me in, in the, in the uh, spring semester? And so I, that's how I ended up, you know, coming back to Columbia to teach this advanced restructuring seminar with him at the same time that I assumed this particular role in clerkships. And I think because of my commitment to, to, to the judiciary in general, just because I just really admire judges, given what I shared with you, my personal story, it just was like a very easy passion project and something that I could really connect myself to with the students because I could see myself in them and, and also understand, you know, coming from an institution like Columbia, they're gonna have so many choices, you know, hopefully preparing them to do their best wherever they go. Um, but also understanding that part of the part of the uh, beauty of the profession is that you can kind of opt into different things at different phases and really enjoy them. Um, and if you can, you know, develop the skill set to be excellent and, and be committed and, and do all the work that um, people throughout your career will support you as you as you move to those different uh, those different phases of your career. So that's how I ended back at Columbia. Um, and I taught for that semester with Judge Gerber. And then we assumed the full-time role of the deanship. And so that's, that's what I've been doing the last three years. Mm -hmm. yeah, you've had such a, an exciting career and, and such a varied career. And I think because of that, you're so valuable to the students. You know, they, even though that you're in charge of clerkship, you have something to tell them about working in the, a big law firm, working in, in corporate banks and corporate America, working for a judge, teaching, working for a law school in a different capacity. So um, they're, they're really lucky to have you there. Um, so there's been a great emphasis in law firms and really in all of corporate America to walk the walk when it comes to diverse hiring and promotion. How do you specifically approach issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion in your role as Dean at Columbia? Sure. Thank you for that question. And I'll just, I'll reflect that, you know, you, you are neat. All the roles that you now play at the, at the firm is such an important institutional change maker and ensuring that the legacy of leaders like Marsha and Lori and Debbie and all these all these individuals continues on. So I just want to first recognize all the work you do at Weill in connection with uh, diversity, equity, inclusion. Um, and I think that's very important that the associates and alumni can see that the people who have committed to the firm and are now our leaders are just continuing on with that spirit of the firm, which I think is, is very unique. Um, so, at Columbia, uh, I'm very privileged that Dean Lester and my faculty felt uh, committed to the concept of ensuring that every qualified Columbia Law student or alum who wants to clerk, who is prepared to clerk, it's a very hard job, um, has the opportunity and the support to clerk. And so um, when I looked at the data on kind of our hiring trends, what we did in the past, um, I realized that it wasn't so much that we didn't have students uh, from different backgrounds or traditionally underrepresented backgrounds who didn't want to clerk um, or the judges didn't want to hire them or the faculty didn't want to support them. It was more about like connecting the dots and making sure that everybody on the field knew their particular role. So I see myself um, kind of like as, as a coach strategizing how to make sure I can get everybody to, to the goal. And as a coach, you want to make sure that all your players who need time on the field are on the field. So for diversity, equity, inclusion, it's like looking at all those students that I have the privilege of counseling and my, my colleagues I work with and saying, okay, who's this particular person? What's their story? What's their gift? And is there potentially a judge that would really work for them? Um, and so I think I start with the individual first and then I think, um, and then I think about connecting to the bigger issues around diversity, equity, inclusion. Um, I will say we, we have at Columbia launched the first uh, diversity initiative uh, among the T14 schools in connection with clerkships. So this year I have 34 two L's who have raised their hands to go through the process with me. And I took them on field trips to the second circuit last week in the Southern district of New York to go meet judges, see trials in person for the first time since the pandemic. Um, and uh, I, a lot of this is about educating them about what it means to actually work at a courthouse, what it would mean to be a litigator versus a transactional attorney. Um, 
you know, giving them an opportunity to see that a courthouse can be a welcoming place, a place where they can feel included. Um, so I'm very intentional about, about this issue because I think that was part of my charge when I, when I assumed this role. And um, I'm very fortunate the faculty have really invested in, and we have a mentoring program with our alums and with our faculty. So um, I think that if you're not intentional, um, even if you have the, you have the best of, um, I, I guess, I guess that you can give the best efforts around other issues, but if you're not intentional on diversity, equity, inclusion, you may miss things that you wouldn't have, um, you just wouldn't have caught if you hadn't thought about it in advance. So I do a lot of work around it, talk with the faculty, make sure that we're being inclusive. And uh, the last class of 2022 has some like the, is one of the most diverse classes in terms of clerkships in 2021 as well. So I think that I think it's proven uh, valuable for the students and for the uh, for the community. Mm -hmm. That's really great, Andrea. Definitely valuable, and you'll be happy to hear. Actually, since you left Wyo, we've continued our and I think even improved upon our diversity efforts. And um, I'm really proud to be a firm that also really cares about those issues and has many programs and a lot of um, intentionally, as, uh, to use a word that you use, really tries to make it, um, progress in in that area. So, um, so you've been commended for your pro bono work throughout your career. Um, what causes are important to you? Um, and have you had a chance to work on any interesting pro bono matters in the last few years? So in my capacity as a dean, I think that um, I'm not practicing law, so I haven't been able to work on any kind of pro bono matters before the courts recently, but I do a lot of advocacy work outside of the courthouse, um, connection to both you know, to my central work as, as the Dean of the clerkship's office, but also in connection with like the next generation of leaders. So for example, um, you know, I raised my hand, I'm now a commissioner of the Latina Commission of Hispanic National Bar Association, where I have some former Y alums, different people I know from different parts of my life were in there. It's been really fabulous trying to help uh, the organization develop the next generation of uh, Latina leaders who are interested in corporate or public service or the judiciary. Um, and uh, I also, you know, do a lot of work in connection with um, the courts in terms of like ensuring that there's workplace um, fairness and different things that I think um, we now as leaders really recognize are important to ensuring that women stay in the workforce and that, um, and that they feel included um, irrespective of background. So those are kind of the, I think the policy matters that I work on in addition to you know, just regular trying to be an active American citizen these days and times that we live in where there are so many challenges for us, um, but where we still live in the greatest, you know, country in the world where we can see, um, for example, today as we're talking, you know, the hearing on the uh, nomination of the first black woman to the Supreme Court, the Honorable Judge Ketanji Jackson. Uh, so with, with, with these things in place, it's, you think to yourself, you know, uh, when you say what I like to do, I just like to make sure that I'm moving the ball forward with the skills that I have and the time that I have as a as a mother also to make sure that you know I balance everything that's that's on our that's on my plate. And I know from recent personal experience that pro bono issues are near and dear to your heart, and also um, you'll never uh, stop being a bankruptcy lawyer at heart because uh, you called me a few months ago with a really sort of creative, wonderful idea on how to use bankruptcy law to achieve some objectives in a, an area of civil rights. Um, and uh, that was really fantastic. And um, anyway, so it um, doesn't yeah, I surprise think, I think me. People, I think like people underestimate like all the things you can do with banker, like, all the things you can do with contracts, one. And then you can think about all things you can do with contracts, what can you undo with bankruptcy? And then what could you do in bankruptcy that you just couldn't do by contract? You know, and so I think like that's how I think about, you know, some of the pro bono matters that we, we talked about and um, trying to get, you know, people to think about that. I mean, I, um, this year, the Stone Moot Court competition is actually a bankruptcy matter. And um, I was asked to read the problem after the students had, had written it, and I thought, yeah, this is great. Like, I love this. Like, they're thinking creatively around bankruptcy issues. And I have like a core contingency of students who come every year, like three to five, who are really interested in bankruptcy. They have a background and they think, I think bankruptcy teaches you to just think creatively, whether it's in service of civil rights um, or you know policy agenda or equity issues, because you always think about the opposite of probably what everybody else in the room is thinking. So, um, so yeah, that is fun, and maybe 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 they'll come together one day, Ronnie. Maybe we'll have a chance to work on that. We'll see. 
that that would be great. Um, yeah, your uh, your great bankruptcy mind and your great intelligence um, remind me of when you were a summer associate and you were the best summer associate I've ever worked with. And I still remember that crazy intense project that we did together and uh, the work product that we put out. So um, it's been nice to kind of come full circle, start with when we first met during the summer and the recent interaction we had on the pro bono manner now and ending with this interview. So um, Andrea, thank you again for joining us and sharing insights into your remarkable career journey. And while alumni, please continue to stay in close touch and be on the lookout for future programs. Thank you so much, Renee, and thank you to Wild for having me back. It's always an honor. Mm -hmm.